The nuclear power plant was revolutionary enough in itself, but when married to the weapon system of the submarine, it opened an entirely new era in undersea warfare. In 1939, physicist Ross Gunn had an idea to use nuclear power in a submarine. Little did he know that his idea would revolutionize naval warfare and shape how our Navy works today. Submarines have been around much longer than one might think. In 1620, Dr. Cornelius Van Drebbel noticed how different forces, such as manual rowing and weight, would draw boats down. He used these physics to create a boat, the Drebbel, that could manually submerge into the water and resurface using boat paddles. In 1755, David Bushnell's turtle was the first submersible to be used in war. In the Revolutionary War, American rebels used the submarine to attach explosive charges on the underside of British blockades. Created in 1863, the Hunley was the second submarine to be used in warfare as a Confederate battle sub. It was powered by hand cranks that rode paddles attached on the side of the submarine. It could only last as long as a person could crank. There were nine crewmen, eight to turn the propeller and one to steer. In 1878, George W. Garrett created the Resergam II, the first mechanical and steam-powered submarine that had a crew of only three. It was driven by a steam-powered propeller. The German Navy was the first military to use diesel and electric submarines, the well-known U-boats. Submarines were new to war, so these were used mainly for blockades instead of attacks. The submarines were underwater, blocking trade going to opposing forces countries. When a ship would come with transports, the U-boats would rise and attack. It was all of these past ships that led to the development of the Nautilus. But the main impetus for the most revolutionary development in the history of man of war came from a passed over U.S. Navy captain called Hyman G. Rickover. In 1939, the idea of nuclear power was becoming more and more popular. Nuclear power was just being truly understood, and other nuclear projects were being worked on, such as the Manhattan Project. The physicist Ross Gunn proposed the idea of using nuclear propulsion in a submarine. The idea was not a big hit, however, because the technology to build a safe nuclear reactor that could fit inside a submarine hull simply did not exist at the time. However, nine years later in 1948, the first work on a nuclear reactor for a submarine began. The greatly respected but feared Admiral Hyman G. Rickover was the man who actually designed the reactor that would work. People feared the four-star admiral because they knew that if they made one small mistake, they were not good enough to work for him. He still has a great legacy today as the father of the nuclear navy. He developed uh, new areas of, of engineering that allowed this, um, this entire type of ship to come into existence and to function safely for up, up until the present day. After Rickover had a design that he trusted and was sure to work, his team proposed their new idea to Congress. Construction for the first nuclear submarine was authorized by Congress December 12, 1951. Finally, what better name to call it but Nautilus, one of the most common names but used on great ships in the past. There was Robert Fulton's Nautilus from 1798, the Diesel Nautilus from 1930, also Jules Verne's fictional Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was very popular at the time. The Nautilus was not just revolutionary, it was the most revolutionary ship of its time. With an S2W reactor, the Nautilus could travel as far as the crew could last. It was much faster than past subs, able to go 23 knots submerged. As a comparison, diesel and electric submarines that were made before the Nautilus could only go 17 knots as their maximum speed. It was essential for non-nuclear submarines to resurface within 24 hours in order to replenish their oxygen supplies. For nuclear subs air, the reactors allow electrolysis to take place. Electrolysis is the splitting of water particles into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen can be separated and collected, providing fresh air. The reactor eliminated the Nautilus's need to surface, ever. As long as the crew had food and good morale, the submarine could remain submerged 
because the radioactive uranium generates power for the reactor for a potentially endless amount of time. One pound of uranium provides as much energy as 2.5 million pounds of coal or a quarter million pounds of fossil fuel. It wasn't that the Nautilus was much faster than many of the diesels that we had, it was its ability to remain submerged for long periods of time and sustain these speeds that made it revolutionary. The American attack submarine Nautilus was launched on January 21, 1954 into the Thames River in New London, Connecticut. The first lady at the time, Mamie Eisenhower, christened it. However, the launching was merely for its sea trials, not the famous journey to the North Pole that was to come. The sea trials were tests that showed what the ship's limits were. On her first voyage, she broke a record, the longest time submerged traveling at a high speed by going 2,223 kilometers in under 90 hours underwater the entire time. On June 19, 1957, Captain William R. Anderson took command of the Nautilus. He was the second commander and skipper, preceded by Eugene P. Wilkinson. On August 19, 1957, the Nautilus left on a training voyage with the diesel sub-trigger, where they would go under the edge of the polar ice cap. On this voyage, the Nautilus logged her 60,000th nautical mile, matching that of Jules Verne's fictional Nautilus from 20,000 leagues under the sea. For its second voyage, Captain Anderson used Russian space satellite Sputnik 1 to promote the crew's idea to travel completely under the polar ice cap. The Sputnik 1 was terrifying to America, because America now knew that if Russia could launch a satellite above us, they could also launch a missile. Anderson's idea was well liked, for the Nautilus could now be part of the Cold War. If the voyage succeeded, it would be a scare to the Russians, knowing that we had a submarine that could sneak up on them. It allowed him to go through the northern, the northern portions of the oceans, and essentially this, this route took them through the backyard of the, of the Soviet Union. After President Eisenhower ordered ultra-secrecy, the mission would be the most secret peacetime naval operation in history. It was not to be known about because there was the fear that the Russians would try to stop the Nautilus. On April 25, 1958, the Nautilus left unescorted from Pearl Harbor for the North Pole. The mission was named Operation Sunshine. A special feature that came with new technology was a new type of sonar. This extremely sensitive sonar could detect wherever ice was around the ship. This is the Arctic Ocean. Somewhere under this sea of ice is an American submarine, the nuclear-powered Nautilus. After a long and mostly uneventful journey to the ice cap, the Nautilus reached the North Pole by going entirely under the ice cap. The Nautilus had finally attained her goal. She had reached the North Pole. Captain Anderson sent out the top secret radio dispatch that simply said, Nautilus 90 North, meaning that they had reached the North Pole. America had caught up with Russia in technology. We had the first submarine to pass under the polar ice cap. This was a huge milestone in naval history and a big push forward for the United States in the Cold War because Russia knew we were equal to them in technology. Nuclear power cut the submarine completely free from the surface ending the need for the air-breathing advertisement of the snorkel. After the Nautilus was created, all diesel, electric, and steam submarines gradually disappeared. By 1961, there were almost a dozen nuclear submarines in service. Today, only nuclear submarines are used in the United States, Russia, France, the UK, China, and India. These are the leading countries in military capacity, and they choose to use nuclear submarines over any other type significance of, of that new type of propulsion was that um, the range of the ships became unlimited, the, uh, the ability to do different missions was, um, was, was brought to the, to the forefront. The ships could be uh, allowed to function in ways that we'd never dreamed of before. The Nautilus was a complete success, demonstrating the power of nuclear propulsion and influencing many other countries' views on submarine warfare. The Nautilus was the first and the finest of its time. We can't imagine what naval warfare would be like today without the technology of the nuclear submarine. It can stay underwater indefinitely, it improves the morale and quality of life of its sailors, and it was an essential weapon of the U.S. Navy, and eventually navies around the world. It must be clear because of the current status it holds today that the SSN 571 Nautilus was the best submarine of its time. It truly was a revolutionary ship.